morning everybody, I'm Madonna Jarrett, Labor's candidate for the upcoming federal election for the seat of Brisbane. I'm here today obviously with Anthony Albanese, um, Murray Watt, Jim Chalmers, Jonty Bush, our local state member. We've just done a walk through Torwood Street. This, this street was very, very badly affected by the floods. The water was, you know, over two metres high. People have lost their homes. We've just done a walk through. I mean, I was out here helping our community carry water soaked mattresses down these stairs, you know, throwing old, old um, loved toys that were full of mud over balconies to get, you know, because houses have to be cleared. Um, there was help, help did come. It was too little too late. If you ask the residents, they will tell you that. Um, very, very they were very, very disappointed in Morrison um, being very, very late to act. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Anthony. Thank, thanks very much, Madonna. And uh, it's been an honour to talk with uh, the residents of this street today who've had devastation, families. We've heard about uh, little babies put on, uh, on boats to be rescued. Uh, we heard about uh, a woman who was 35 weeks pregnant with twins having to be uh, evacuated in order to ensure that she was safe because there was no chance of her swimming out in that condition given the two and a half metres of water that impacted on this community. Uh, I've been to uh, flood affected communities here in Brisbane on a number of occasions and it is, it is just quite shocking uh, to see the devastation uh, that was there. Uh, the residents of this street are of course unable to continue to occupy uh, their homes. Uh, there'll be a lot of work needed to be done in the future. Uh, but uh, what we saw from the federal government, whether it be bushfires, floods or the pandemic, is a real pattern of behaviour. Uh, Scott Morrison, uh, when uh, after the election in the 2019-20 bushfires, went missing and he failed to act soon enough and he only acted when the political pressure was really put on. On the pandemic he said it wasn't a race and didn't order enough vaccines and we know that not only were we not at the front of the queue which Mr Morrison said we were way 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 at the back of the queue and on floods we saw again a political response rather than a human response rather than looking at people who were going through a really tough time and saying, what can we do to help? There's something that defines Australians. They make sacrifices for each other. They look after each other. Neighbour looking after neighbour, stranger looking after stranger. That's what happened here in the floods with people in tinnies rescuing families. Uh, that's what happened during the bushfire crisis. And that's what happened during the pandemic as well, with people going out there and getting vaccinated so that not just for their own health, but for the health of everyone they came into contact with. What we need is a government that is as good and strong and committed as the Australian people are themselves to helping each other. A government that steps up, that doesn't have to be pressured into stepping up. And on the floods, of course, we've seen a politicisation. Uh, we've seen members like Catherine Cusack from the Liberal Party, Jeff Provis from the National Party, uh, state MPs saying that they couldn't see themselves continuing to support the Morrison government because of the way that Scott Morrison government made political decisions based upon uh, what electorate you were in in New South Wales or what state you were in, whether you're in New South Wales or Queensland. We need to do much better. The Queensland government wrote to so Scott Morrison asked for support and then uh, Scott Morrison wrote back and said, no, it's not available uh, for the share of the $700 million plus uh, package uh, that they wanted uh, to help people get back on their feet. It was only after a few days pressure that Scott Morrison changed his mind. It should be a partnership, not just a partnership between governments, a partnership between people and government. A government that people should be able to rely upon to step up. And it's similar in terms of people being left behind when it comes to the government's decision that they've made uh, to make Anne Rustin uh, the health minister. Uh, this is a health minister now, designate, uh, if uh, they're successful in the election, who we know will undermine Medicare, who has said that the current model is not sustainable, who has said that Medicare funding is just putting things on the credit card and that it needs to change. 
This is another example of what we can expect if Scott Morrison is re-elected. If Scott Morrison is re-elected, we can expect cuts to health, cuts to education, cuts to other essential services. Uh, because this is a Prime Minister who only defines action by what's in the short-term political interest of himself. And I'd ask uh, Jim if he wants to make some comments as well. Thanks very much, Anthony. Uh, the Prime Minister's hand-picked Health Minister was given multiple opportunities this morning to rule out further cuts to Medicare and she couldn't do it. Uh, Medicare is not safe under Scott Morrison and Anne Rustin. That much is clear. The appointment of Anne Rustin to be Scott Morrison's hand-picked Health Minister will send a shiver down the spine of every Australian who needs affordable health care based on Medicare. Universal access to Medicare is at risk if Scott Morrison and Anne Rustin are given another three years to undermine Medicare. One of the key differences between Labor and Liberal in this election is we will always look to strengthen Medicare. The Liberals and Nationals will always look to undermine it. That's what this appointment is all about. Australians can't afford rising health care costs and that means they can't risk another three years of Scott Morrison, the Liberals and the Nationals. Mr. 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 Just before we take some questions, it's great to join you here again, Madonna. I remember being here with you in Tilwood Street just after the floods only a few weeks ago. And the reason we are here today is to show these residents that in Anthony Albanese, they would get a Prime Minister who's there for the floods and there for the recovery as well. I don't know why it is that Scott Morrison, whenever Queenslanders need him the most, he turns his back. At the height of COVID, he was demanding that Queensland's, Queensland's borders be opened, no matter what the health consequences for Queensland. And he's done it again now in the floods. As Anthony said, uh, what we saw from Scott Morrison recently was when the Queensland Government asked for support to help homeowners like the people we've met today to rebuild and to re-raise their homes. He said no, even though he was prepared to give similar support to New South Wales. Right now, flood victims in New South Wales are getting three times the payment that the people in Torwood Street and Auckland Flower and everywhere else in Queensland are getting. And of course, he declared a national emergency in New South Wales after the floods, but he wouldn't do that in Queensland as well. Why is it that whenever Queenslanders need Scott Morrison the most, he always turns his back, whether it's COVID, whether it's floods, whether it's infrastructure or anything else. It's about time Queenslanders and all of Australians had a Prime Minister who's prepared to work with the whole country, bring the whole country together, not pit state against state and mate against mate. We need someone who's going to work for the whole country, and that person is Anthony Albanese. Mr Albanese, Mr. Albanese can I please Stella. just... Stella. Thank you she so much. She seems keen. Okay. <laughs> The latest resolve poll, I'm sure you've seen it. How do you grapple with such a damning assessment um, of your performance in the first week of the campaign as we enter a second week? I said when the campaign opened that we were the underdogs in this campaign. I've consistently said that it's a mountain that Labor seeks to climb. A mountain that seeks to climb because we've only done it three times since the Second World War. So it's always tough for Labor to win from opposition, so we know how tough it's going to be. But we also know our obligation to get there, to climb that mountain. Because if we're going to defend Medicare, if we're going to defend secure work, if we're going to take action on climate change, if we're going to look after people in disasters, we need a Labor government. Remember this, the government had a $4 billion emergency response fund that they treated like an ATM and just added up to $4.8 billion as if there wasn't a need uh, to invest and to uh, take action. Uh, under the announcement that Murray and I made in January, we'll have a disaster ready fund, $200 million a year, every year, working with local communities, working with state governments to make sure that we address these issues. And Mr. Albany, I asked you a question yesterday about backwards. your key one of your key health policies, and you didn't answer it, so I'm going to ask you again. Mark Butler yesterday said that all 50 of your urgent care clinics will be up and running by mid next year. How many additional, additional nurses and GPs do you need to staff those facilities, and where are they going to come from? Look, we're going to need uh, additional nurses and doctors. How many? Uh, we're going to need a, a, additional. But as, as it goes, that you, you don't actually train doctors and nurses just for one thing. What we know is, with the ageing of the population, 
with the increased numbers of people who will need assistance in terms of aged care. We're going to have to invest in education and training. And that's why we've announced 20,000 additional university places. That's why we've announced 465,000 fee-free take places. Uh, this is critical uh, that we train. We know uh, that it's a challenge, uh, but we know also that we have an obligation, uh, regardless of who's in government, to train more nurses, uh, to train more doctors. We also need to make sure that we shape, and we'll have more to say about this uh, as we go down the track of this campaign as well, about, about, uh, about GPs and what going forward. Policy? These won't be run by the government. These won't be run centrally. So these, these will come through. These will be determined by the people who run the centres, which is existing, existing GP, existing GP clinics, and and uh, community health centres. We are. But we're not giving the finer details as to what's behind it. So do you know how many nurses you will need to take care of the patients? Each place is different. Uh, we know, for example, that the Melanoma Institute, in terms of the funding that you raised on Saturday, the Melanoma Institute will use that funding of $14 million uh, to employ uh, additional nurses. They say uh, that that will allow them to employ 35 additional nurses. Um, players now saying that Alan Touch um, urging Rochelle Miller not to disclose their affair may have been a criminal offence. What's your message for Australian voters uh, regarding this saga that just well, the Alan Touch saga is one that, that I struggle to uh, get my head around, let alone average Australians. I mean, is Alan Touch still a minister? Is he still in the cabinet? Is he still education minister? How is it that there's been a half a million dollar payout using taxpayer funds, and yet the Prime Minister says it has nothing to do with Mr Touch? So uh, these are questions. Uh, that need to be answered. They need to be answered by the government. Mr Albanese, yeah. Mr. Albanese sure. um, on call, Adani has confirmed it's fielding inquiries about the use of the Galilee Basin rail line from potential third party operators. What is Labor's position on the expansion of the Galilee coal mine and would Labor approve new coal mines if it won government, considering some are already going through the approval system? Yeah. Uh, Labor's position on this is, is very clear. Uh, that uh, you have appropriate environmental approvals and if, if coal mines stack up uh, environmentally and then commercially, which is a decision for the companies, then they get approved. And then Labor would welcome any jobs that would be created from that. Uh, it's important uh, because of the way that the Act works that we don't preempt the environmental approvals process and that that is able to take place independently of government intervention because that's what the Act requires. But would the government give federal approvals? If I, I, I think I answered it pretty clearly, that uh, yes, if it goes through the environmental approval process that's established uh, under the Federal Act, under the Federal legislation, uh, then uh, it, would be, uh, it, it would be approved. Mr. Yes. Albanese, go, go, please, please. Mr. Albanese, <laughs> how did you cost your health policies without assuming levels of nursing and GPs that would be required. How do you know that to set up 50 uh, clinics will cost $135 million if you haven't assumed a certain number of GPs and nurses will be required? So which is it? Do you not know exactly how many nurses and GPs are needed? Or that figure is based on an unknown number? No, it varies. It varies. These are 50 clinics. But that the policy, but th not these are these clinic are 50 clinic. clinics that won't be run by the government. They'll be run by either GP You're clinics, yes, either by GP clinic. What what we pay for, as well as to provide some some investment, uh, so that uh, these projects become viable. Mr. Albanese, on housing, the, the coalition announced today an increase in the amount of money uh, under its policy. I'm wondering, do you support it? And isn't it, this is a chicken and egg, that policy is enabling people to bid up the price of houses, which make them more expensive, which makes the better the other hands, they have more money into the, into the housing process system, which is then pushing up prices. 
places and, and gener leaving a generation unable to afford a house. Yeah, I'll ask Jim to add to this, but uh, we have said for some time that the caps uh, weren't high enough for people to be able to uh, buy a, a home in some areas uh, because of the considerable increase uh, in, uh, in in housing that's occurred, uh, particularly in some of the regions as well. But yeah, obviously, as you know, Shane, it's a perennial challenge in the housing market. House prices have been going through the roof, and that's before you get to renters and all the rest of it. We've been very supportive of the government's plan for first home deposit savers, and we've said for some time that we don't think the caps are appropriate. So, to the extent that the caps are being changed today, we welcome that. This is obviously not the only part of a, a good, uh, broad housing policy. We've also got our policy around social and affordable housing, and we'll have more to say on housing but between now and then. can't you see that this, is, this actually enables house prices to keep going up? Well, you can't address every challenge in the housing market simultaneously with one policy, and that's the point that I'm making. The issue that this is about is helping people get a toehold in the housing market, which we think is absolutely important, crucial that that happen, but it's not the only step you need to take in housing, social and affordable housing as well, and other steps which we'll make clear between now and now. Mr. Thomas, 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 So our, our policy for urgent care centres is about taking pressure off emergency departments. It's based on work done by the Parliamentary Budget Office and those costings will be finalised and released in the usual way at the usual time. So how do you but get the number without? If you just let me finish there. So the point that uh, Anthony has been making and Mark and we have all been making is that these are existing centres being asked to stay open for longer to take the pressure off emergency departments. Our responsibility as a federal government is to make sure that we are training enough doctors and nurses. That's why one of our most important policies is around TAFE and university, because there is a skill shortage in this economy. The responsibility of the centres is to find people to work out whether people will be working longer or more people will be on shifts. Our responsibility is to provide the incentive for the urgent care centres to stay open longer, to take the pressure off the emergency departments, uh, they will find the doctors and nurses. Our responsibility is to train them. So you did Mr. Mr. Alvin, is it Mr. 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 fair chorus of booing at the Blues Fest last night. Your polling's down sharply today. Are you concerned that by stumbling so frequently on policy in this campaign, you're losing votes? Well, it was a terrific uh, night last night, and I thank uh, Barnsley for the invite. I've got to say to Blues Fest, and uh, he gave a great set, and it's fantastic that the arts and entertainment sector uh, that were left behind during the pandemic, they didn't get enough support are getting back on their feet. Uh, I interacted with a whole lot of artists uh, yesterday as well as a lot of people. And uh, the artists uh, uniformly uh, were just grateful that they were able to perform. Some of them told stories about not having to, not being able to perform uh, for two years. Uh, they've been doing it really tough and uh, it's good that Blues Fest, uh, a great festival, was able to go ahead. How would you Mr. rate Albert, your performance Mr. Albert, Mr. Albert, 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 in the past week with all those stumbles, as Mark was saying? Well, I'm not a commentator. Uh, what I know is that Australia needs a new government. Australia needs a better future. And the feedback that I get uh, around the country, whether it's in Cairns, uh, whether it was uh, in Bangalow, uh, whether it be uh, in, in Byron yesterday, and indeed right around the country uh, where I've been to uh, every state uh, in the last couple of weeks is that uh, Australians really know uh, that this government's tired, it's out of puff, it's out of time, it doesn't have an agenda for this term, let alone a plan for the next one. We have a plan for a better future. We'll continue to put our case to defend Medicare and strengthen it, to take pressure off living standards by having cheaper childcare and to have cheaper electricity through our climate action policy. We've got a plan for jobs and for the economy. Uh, just as, just as uh, we've seen in the past economic reforms leading to greater social equity. In, in this case, the economic reform uh, of, uh, of the, the, this decade uh, will be uh, very much driven by our Powering Australia plan. Uh, that transition will create 604,000 new jobs, five out of every six in regional Australia, $52 billion of private sector 
investment will reduce emissions by 43% by 2030. We can be a renewable energy superpower for the world. And we can use that cheap, clean energy to power high value manufacturing, to make more things here. And then we can train Australians through our plan for Jobs and Skills Australia, fee free TAFE, additional university places for those jobs. It's a coherent strategy that fits together of how we use uh, the opportunity that is there from dealing with climate change to drive manufacturing, to drive jobs and to skill up Australians to fill those Mr. 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 Albanese, is there is incorrect information is being distributed by Labor in some marginal seats about the cashless debit card. Are you going to be pulling that from the campaign? Absolutely not. Now, this is a key issue. Uh, wherever you go in Australia, uh, pensioners are worried about Scott Morrison and Anne Ruston's comments about the expansion of this scheme nationwide. We make absolutely no apology whatsoever for standing up for the pensioners of this country who are petrified that this cashless debit card will be extended to them. There are comments on the record from Scott Morrison, from Anne Ruston, talking about expanding the scheme, talking about it being a national platform. There's a very clear difference here and people on pensions right around Australia need to understand it. Scott Morrison and Anne Ruston have thought aloud and, and, and raised the prospect of expanding this scheme. Uh, Labor will abolish the cashless debit card. We couldn't be any clearer than that. The Prime Minister and his now hand-picked Health Minister have been given multiple opportunities uh, in recent times to rule out this expansion. And if they do it now, in the teeth of an election, you know that you can't believe them. It's the same with Medicare. They They've said before pensions. elections before no cuts pensions. to Medicare. And after the election, they've gone and attacked Medicare, and this is in the same boat. So we will not be stepping back from raising this important issue on behalf of the pensioners of this country who know that Scott Morrison and Anne Ruston, if given the opportunity, will expand this Mr. scheme. Mr. Chairman, 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 Mr. Three seats. Um, what's your response to that? Are you going to win three seats in WA? Uh, my objective, of course, when you start off in an election campaign, is to campaign in every seat. Uh, but what we know, uh, I, I haven't commented on that. The, he's probably commenting on the, the West Australians' polls. Uh, but we we are working uh, to win majority government, and we make no apologies for saying uh, that we're very hopeful of a positive result in Western Australia. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the Prime Minister called Western Australians cave dwellers and rejected uh, their government's uh, uh, efforts uh, to keep them safe. And secondly, that when Scott Morrison had a choice between Mark McGowan, he, he likes to talk about choice. Well, here's the choice that Scott Morrison had. He had a choice between Mark McGowan and Clive Palmer, and he chose Clive Palmer. And he used taxpayers' money to fund a submission so that the Commonwealth joined in on that case in the West, on the side of Clive Palmer. Clive Palmer, who was trying to take tens of billions of dollars uh, off WA taxpayers uh, through separate legal action. Clive Palmer, who continues to take legal action against Mark McGowan. Well, I know what side I'm on. I'm on the side of Mark McGowan. Thanks very much.